pain, sadness, humiliation. Only the gods on Olympus knew the innermost feelings of the Hellenes as they lay at the mercy of the most terrible of barbarian threats. But this was certain. Mycenaean civilization was dead, flayed by the machinations of a single woman and her demonic sea people. But what was as certain was what the hell was going through the minds of the Dorians, i.e. partially civilized Greeks in the aftermath of the initial Mycenaean liberation of the peninsula. You see, for all their lives, the Dorians seethed at their serfdom at the hands of their Mycenaean overlords. Despite the Mycenaeans giving so much to them, the Dorians, at the first sign of Mycenaean weakness, revolted en masse. But fate had other plans, as the gods intended to use the Dorians as an example to the rest of Hellas. For as soon as the Dorians raised their heads while they faced the Mycenaeans, the sea people, still around, and still very thirsty for the blood of the unclean, butchered the Dorians, down to the last man, limiting them to Epirus, the Peloponnese, Crete, and Ionia. Despite the Dorians being the descendants of serfs and thus bullfuckers, the Mycenaean blood in them still yielded some virtue in them, as a number of Dorians would eventually begin the reconstruction of Sparta, and we all know where that leads. Meanwhile, as the Mycenaean Empire burned and Agamemnon lay dead, the Greeks suddenly found themselves without leaders to turn to, as the provincial governors and kings were all butchered by the sea people. The people turned to their local Guasileus, local mayors that governed the villages, towns, and cities of what was the empire, and it falls upon those men to guide the Hellenic people to prosperity, later known as the Basileus, or Basileus as a singular. This coincided with a mass ruralization of the Greek world, as small areas filled with hundreds of thousands of people are obvious targets for sea people and other uncouth people. Greeks fled to the mountains and hills around the cities, returning to the old Yanmaya pastoralist lifestyle, herding animals and farming with whatever fertile lands there was in the hills of Greece. Aside from the countryside of Greece, the Greeks also fled east to the coast of Anatolia and the island of Cyprus, using their superior seamanship to evade the sea people and colonize the burning remnants of the Hittite Empire. Not that there was much there anyway, for them barbarian mud huts. As time passed, the sea people slowly died out, not being able to find enough people to sustain their hunger for blood. And so the seas opened up once more, with the Greeks in Ionia and Cyprus, combined with their defensible terrain and sea access, becoming among the first to rebuild what once was. While in the homeland, despite the old order being destroyed, Helen and her sea people could not destroy one thing and that is the Hellenic spirit, to rebuild what was destroyed, to undo the defeat of the Mycenaean Empire, and pick up the torch that is civilization, and spread it to the whole world. It was a difficult task, but if the gods chose the Greeks to undertake it, any challenge is tolerable. And so, the Greeks began to rebuild. During the reconstruction process, the great thinkers of the time concluded that the main reason the Mycenaean Empire collapsed wasn't their defeat at the hands of the sea people, but primarily their reliance on foreign trade and influence, especially for bronze, which components couldn't be found naturally on the Greek mainland. So the Greeks cut themselves off from the uncivilized world, and focused on perfecting their interior before spreading civilization elsewhere. Part of their plan to remove foreign influence from Hellenic society was to shift away from bronze tools and weapons to iron. As smelting technology grew better, iron tools, which were sharper, more durable, and better in general, became available to the civilized world. Greece, that is. With iron tools now in use, the reconstruction of Greece was put into high gear. As food cultivation increased, so did population and excess labor. And with excess labor, culture began to rebuild itself. The first manifestation of this was geometric pottery, aka the funny line shit that appears on anything trying to appear Greek, for no bad reason, as this generation of pottery was better baked, moulded, and drawn than early Dark Age pottery ever was, obviously. During this time, the Greek alphabet was also adopted, revolutionizing writing across the Greek world, as great thinkers can now write down their thoughts and spread them to the world and future generations, which culminated in Homer, the first historian ever to write down the histories of the Iliad and the Odyssey, aka the stories of the Trojan War and the journeys of Odysseus. Homer describes a time that most had forgotten, a time when men were heroes, stronger, wiser, and more virtuous than the Dark Age Greeks, such as the Dorians, 
and this was the final ignition in the soul of Hellas, as in order to honour the great ancestors like Perseus, Theseus, or Heraclius, they too must become great, a mindset that fueled some of the greatest men of the next period of history, the Archaic Period. And so, as the Dark Age came to a close, and the light could be seen once more, the Hellenic world looks to the future, with nothing short of a burning desire to go down in history as the greatest civilization of all time.